First of all, you're going to hear from Benjamin Netanyahu. I'm playing this because he spoke uh, a month or so ago at the United Nations. And I want to show you why what's happening to Israel is happening. And it's a direct result of this thing that Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister uh, in Israel, they have a president, but he's just an administrative head. He's not the man with power. The prime minister is the man with the power. And he is speaking at the United Nations, and this is before Israel was attacked. And what I want to show you is why they were attacked. They were attacked because of, the, in my opinion, because of this speech, they are trying to undo everything he just said to the United Nations. So I'm going to show you uh, six minutes or so of Benjamin Netanyahu, and then I'm going to show you an Arab and I'm going to show you an Arab's position on Palestinians. And I want to give you a quick four-minute video from an Arab. In it, you will hear my voice because the video that I received was just him speaking in Arabic and, uh, and, and the words, you know, captioned on the screen. But he talks way too fast, and so the words go by too quickly. And so I wanted to make this something you could actually not just read but hear so I'm doing the, the translation by reading the screen for you. And so that'll be the next thing. And then the last one is going to be Mark Driscoll. He did something really interesting. He talked about how Hamas, the group that's responsible for this Nazi-like behavior this two weeks ago, how these people are actually someone mentioned in the Bible and what it means there will be amazing to you. So when we put all of this together, I'm just trying to help you to sort out and to see a biblical opinion or perspective on what's happening in the world right now. Let's start with Benjamin Netanyahu. Ladies and gentlemen, over three millennia ago, our great leader Moses addressed the people of Israel as they were about to enter the promised land. He said they would find there two mountains facing one another. Mount Gerizim, the site on which a great blessing would be proclaimed, and Mount Ebal, the site of a great curse. Moses said, that the people's fate would be determined by the choice they made between the blessing and the curse. That same choice has echoed down the ages, not just for the people of Israel, but for all humanity. We face such a choice today. It will determine whether we enjoy the blessings of a historic peace of boundless prosperity and hope, or suffer the curse of a horrific war of terrorism and despair. When I last spoke at this podium five years ago, I warned about the tyrants of Tehran. They've been nothing but a curse, a curse to their own people, to our region, to the entire world. But at that time, I also spoke about a great blessing that I could see on the horizon. Here's what I said, quote, the common threat of Iran has brought Israel and many Arab states closer than ever before in a friendship that I have not seen in my lifetime. I said the day would soon arrive when Israel would be able to expand peace beyond Egypt and Jordan to other Arab neighbors, end quote. Now, in countless meetings with world leaders, I made the case that Israel and the Arab states shared many common interests, and that I believed that these many common interests could facilitate a breakthrough for a broader peace in our region. Thank you. Well, you applaud now, but at the time, many dismissed my optimism as wishful thinking. Their pessimism 
was based on a quarter century of good intentions and failed peacemaking. And why was this, why were these good intentions, why did they always meet failure? Because they were based on one false idea, that unless we first concluded a peace agreement with the Palestinians, no other Arab state would normalize its relations with Israel. I've long sought to make peace with the Palestinians. But I also believe that we must not give the Palestinians a veto over new peace treaties with Arab states. The Palestinians could greatly benefit from a broader peace. They should be part of that process, but they should not have a veto over the process. And I also believe that making peace with more Arab states would actually increase the prospects of making peace between Israel and the Palestinians. See, the Palestinians are only 2% of the Arab world. As long as they believe that the other 90% will remain in a warlike state with Israel, that larger mass, that larger Arab world could eventually choke, dissolve, and destroy the Jewish state. So when the Palestinians see that most of the Arab world has reconciled itself to the Jewish state, they too will be more likely to abandon the fantasy of destroying Israel and finally embrace a path of genuine peace with it. Now, as the circle of peace expands, I believe that a real path towards a genuine peace with our Palestinian neighbors can finally be achieved. But there's a caveat. It has to be said here, forcefully. Peace can only be achieved if it is based on truth. It cannot be based on lies. It cannot be based on endless vilification of the Jewish people. Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas must stop spreading the horrible anti-Semitic conspiracies against the Jewish people and the Jewish state. I mean, I mean, he recently said that Hitler wasn't an anti-Semite. You can't make this up. But he did. He said that. And the Palestinian Authority must stop glorifying terrorists. They must stop its ghoulish pay-to-slay policy of giving money to Palestinian terrorists for the murder of Jews. This is all outrageous. It must stop for peace to prevail. And anti-Semitism must be rejected wherever it appears, whether on the left or on the right, whether in the halls of universities or in the halls of the United Nations. For peace to prevail, the Palestinians must stop spewing Jew hatred, finally reconcile themselves to the Jewish state. By that I mean not only to the existence of the Jewish state, but to the right of the Jewish people to have a state of their own in their historic homeland, the land of Israel. And let me tell you, the people of Israel yearn for such a peace. I yearn for such a peace. Okay, there, there's a whole lot there. A lot of what I did last week in my message addresses why the biblical position is to back Israel. Uh, Israel was given the land in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, uh, by God. God said, it's my land. I give it to whoever I want, and I'm giving it to the Jewish people. This is the Christian position that we agree with anything God does, and whatever God says, we say amen to that. Now, what he's talking about is that people, the people in Gaza are Palestinians. There is really no such thing as Palestinians. And I want you to know that the Palestinian people are not Arabs. They are not Arabs. They would, I know if you don't, if you're not informed about this, you would just think of all the people that are over there and Muslims 
are all of the same ethnicity, but they're not. Persians, which is Iran, are not Arabs. They're Muslim, but they're not Arabs. Palestinians are not Arabs. So they don't trace to Abraham, and they have no claim to have a right to the land of Israel because they're Johnny-come-latelys to Israel. They are not even Arabs who are the ones who could claim equal, let's say, rights because Abraham is the father of both Jews and, uh, and Arabs. This Arab gets it that I'm going to show you next, and he tells the truth and I would say he is almost 100% right about everything he says here. He's going to tell you what Palestinians are, what peoples they really are, and how they have no right to any place in Israel. Watch this. There's nothing that Saudi Arabia didn't give you. It even established the state for you. King Fahad. When President Reagan asked King Fahad, to finance the Contras rebel groups. He said, one good turn deserves another. King Fahad said, give me a Palestinian state. Reagan said, okay. They agreed upon a Palestinian state. King Fahad informed Arafat that they had gotten a Palestinian state. Arafat ran away and agreed to meet King Fahad 10 years later after all of this. Arafat wasn't interested in a Palestinian state. None of you want a Palestinian state. You have no case, no country, no land. This land belongs to Israel. According to the Quran, you are a displaced people, scattered from all over, Mongols, Turkmens, Circassian, Armenians, Gypsies. You have nothing in Palestine. Palestine is the state of Israel for the people of Israel. And the people of Israel, just so you'll know, the people of Israel are the sons of Israel. And we Arabs are the sons of Ishmael. Isaac and Ishmael were brothers, and their father was Abraham. That makes them our cousins. But where did you come from? How are you a part of all of this? Originally, you were scattered gypsies, Mongols, Turkmens, Circassian, Romans, leftovers of other peoples. How are you a part of all this? How are you a part of us? The people of Israel live in their land, but you have no land and have no case. Don't try to fool us. And about the Al-Aqsa Mosque, just so you'll know, there is no such thing as Al-Aqsa. There is only Al-Quds, which means Jerusalem. The Al-Aqsa Mosque mentioned in the Quran is located in Ju'arana, 29 kilometers from the city of Taif, Saudi Arabia. There are two mosques there, the Al-Aqsa, the furthest, and the Al-Adna, the closest. Your Al-Aqsa Mosque was built by Hisham in the year 682 AD. How could Muhammad visit a structure which was built in the year 682 AD, 60 years after Muhammad had died? Who are you trying to fool? You Palestinians? You are not Arabs. You have no land and no case. The land belongs to Israel and the case is the case of Israel. Back then, Israeli prime ministers Itzhak Shamir, Rabin, Sharon, Golda Meir, and another one, I forgot his name. They were heroes. Did you know? But Prime Minister Netanyahu is a coward? Because Netanyahu didn't burn you? Netanyahu, burn these criminals. Dispose of them already for your sake and the world's and ours. Why do you keep them? Why did you open the borders and let them escape? In Jordan, they caused the Black September of 1970. In Kuwait, they plundered when Saddam Hussein occupied that country in 1991. They wore the Iraqi army uniform and looted stores. They kept on being mean and despicable. It's part of their education and who they are. If you're a man, Netanyahu, why not do the world a favor and get rid of them? God curse you and curse even Netanyahu for not getting rid of you. Because Netanyahu throws you a life preserver. He's the one who is supposed to torment you and dispose the world of your evil deeds.
You Palestinians are evil in any country you set foot on. Pure evil and no decent man amongst you. I'm willing to spend the night with a Jew, but not a Palestinian. I'm willing to host a Jew in my house, give him food and water and a bed to sleep in. I will not let a Palestinian enter my home. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you and goodbye. Now that's a straight shooter, <laughs> shooter there. Um, but he's he's right. They're, they're, uh, the land of Palestine was named by an enemy of Israel in the year 130 or so A.D. after Israel was ransacked and destroyed in 70 A.D. by Titus. And so what we have is we have the people of Israel who were put into that land by God 3,500 years ago. And there is no people, Palestinian or otherwise, who was there before that. The people, as I said last week, the people that were there before that are gone. Canaanites, Amorites, Ammonites, you name it. They don't exist anymore. So they, you know, there's none of them saying, oh, it's our land. We were here first. They, they're totally gone. So that is, that is a really interesting perspective because it tells us about what Scripture says prophetically what's going to happen. As I said, I read Revelation last night. It talks about how when the temple is built, that it's going to be surrounded by Gentiles. It, it looks to me like in Revelation, it's telling us that the temple, which is going to be rebuilt very soon, uh, because the Antichrist is going to set himself up in it as God, this temple is going to probably reside, coincide with the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which this guy is saying the Arabs know is not really a Muslim mosque that Muhammad had anything to do with. And that's very interesting because they've got to come to that understanding to allow the Jews to occupy a portion of the Temple Mount, which right now they do not. So that's, that's, that's something that there's a lot of detail I could fill in there, but I don't want to keep you. I want you to see this last five-minute video. This is Mark Driscoll. I show you him once in a while. He, he's very interesting. I, I find myself very amused by a lot of things he says. And this in particular is mind-boggling. I did not know Hamas, H-A-M-A-S, or it's sometimes pronounced Kamas, that this is a biblical word. So let's hear him describe this for the next few moments. Let me talk about Hamas. Hamas is a Palestinian acronym for the Islamic resistance movement. It is also an Arabic word that means zeal, Hamas. All of the headlines now, Hamas. Hamas is also a Hebrew word in the Bible. It appears here in Genesis 6, 11, in the days of Noah. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence, Hamas. Hamas is the Hebrew word for violent evil. And that word filled is sometimes translated, including in Jeremiah, if memory serves me correct, as possessed. The whole world was possessed by the spirit of Hamas. It's demonic possession globally. Demonic possession is the counterfeit of being filled with the spirit. Hamas is a spirit. Hamas is a de demonic spirit of violence that is antichrist. And it is intentionally um, motivated to attack and destroy the Abrahamic covenant. Take the land and the lineage and redefine who the Lord is. I'm telling you that Hamas is a demonic spirit that has been at work since the days of Noah. What did God do to everyone who had the spirit of Hamas in the days of Noah? He flooded the earth and destroyed them. The spirit of Hamas that possessed all people caused them to be destroyed. And the only people who survived and lived were not filled with the Hamas spirit, but the Holy Spirit. Hamas is a word that is used to refer to, and all of this is in my notes, the Chaldeans and the Babylonians in Jeremiah 31.5.
the Shechemites in Judges 9.34, and the Egyptians in Joel 3.19. Not only were people filled with the spirit of Hamas in the days of Noah, also they were filled with the spirit of Hamas in the Chaldean Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Shechemite Empire, and the Egyptian Empire. The point is this, people come and go, but the demons remain the same. The spirit of Hamas is always working in and through nations, governments, and peoples to bring about possession of the land, ending of the lineage, and destruction of the plan of the Lord. Um, Hamas is a demonic and powerful warrior spirit. And when you see Hamas being celebrated globally, know that that is worship and it is spiritual warfare. Now, back to the story, Sarah, Hagar, Isaac, Ishmael. Conflict in the home, Abraham is the father of two sons and there's only one covenant. Which son will inherit the promise of the covenant? There's conflict between the wives, conflict between the sons. Sarah decides to kick Hagar out of the house. Are you ready? Genesis 16. Sarah said to Abraham, may the wrong Hamas done to me be on you. I gave my servant Hagar to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived Ishmael, she looked at me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Now, Sarah invited Hagar into the home and it was her idea for her husband to marry this Egyptian woman. And when Hagar moved into the home, Sarah told her husband, we need to cast out. You know what you do with a demon? You cast it out. Sarah went to her husband and said, we need to cast out that woman because she has brought Hamas into our home. The spirit of Hamas came with Hagar. It's a demonic spirit. The Hamas spirit that was in the days of Noah came into Abraham's house with Hagar. And the conflict was between the Holy Spirit and the Hamas spirit. Therefore, Abraham had to choose between the Hamas spirit and the Holy Spirit in his household. He chose the Holy Spirit and his wife, Sarah, and their son, Isaac, and he cast out, like a demon, Hagar and the Hamas spirit, along with her son, Ishmael. Are you following me? And the Bible doesn't just tell us what happened, but what always happens. And we don't just look at the Bible, we look through the Bible to make sense of the world in which we live. The battle in Abraham's home is the battle in Abraham's homeland today. The Hamas spirit versus the Holy Spirit and they cannot coexist. That's pretty phenomenal. I did a look up on that word. It's, there's 50 times used in the Old Testament, Hamas, spirit of violence. And uh, there is one last thing I want you to think about. That's this. If you are visual and you can think of a map of that area, if you go to Israel and you go straight up the map, you run straight all the way up as far north as you can and you hit Russia. Russia is going to lead a coalition, according to Ezekiel 38, right down into Israel to try to destroy them. And they're going to gather, not Arabs, they're going to gather the other nations around the northern part of Israel that are Muslim. That is going to be the spirit of Hamas. So I'll just tell you confidently that I can tell you what's going to happen in the future based on what, because I believe the Bible is accurate prophetically. Ezekiel 38 tells me, here's what's going to happen. Israel is going to continue to make peace with the Arabs. That's what the, the, this war is meant to stop because they were getting ready to sign a peace deal. The Abraham Accords, that's what they were getting ready to sign. And then the Arabs are saying right now it's on hold. Okay, so I'll go out on a limb because I know my Bible. They will sign that a peace accord because in Isaiah uh, or Ezekiel 38, it says that Russia, Turkey, Iran and Ethiopia. Ethiopia is on this side. Iran, Persia is over here. 
Turkey's up here, and then Russia's further above Turkey. Those are the ones who are going to coalesce less together, and they're going to come down to destroy Israel, and God's going to save Israel. Not even the United States is going to step in. But it also says the Arabs are going to say, hey, what are you doing? In other words, the Arabs are not going to be a part of it. So the spirit of Hamas, which he's talking about, really applies not to the Arabs because they're not going to be a part of this deal. They are going to actually stand by and say, why are you doing this? It is going to be Ethiopia. That's northern Africa. It's going to be Turkey right above, and it's going to be Russia, and it's going to be Persia, which is on the side, uh, Iran and Iraq are over here. And these are the ones who are going to converge together, and they're going to attack Israel. If it happens... In the, in very soon, if, if Putin gets involved with this, you can just go read Ezekiel 38 and see that the Bible is coming to life right here, right now. So I'm not saying that's going to happen in the next week or two or, or month or whatever. I'm just saying if you see Russia join with Turkey and Iran to destroy Israel, you're looking at Ezekiel 38. That's what you're looking at. And I'm telling you right now, the Arabs are not going to have anything to do with this. Egypt is not. Uh, Saudi Arabia is not. They are not going to join that coalition. Why? Because the Bible says it's going to be exactly the opposite. Let's stand. Lord, thank you for bringing us together tonight. We pray for Israel. These are your people with a future. They may not know you yet. There may be a lot of them that aren't even religious. But we know the Bible says that you're bringing the world to a point where you can save Israel and turn them back to the living God. And so we know they are your people, but they are not in relationship with you yet. But they will be soon because you're going to make things happen to show them that you will save them from their enemies. And so, Lord, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Come, Lord Jesus, restore the kingdom of Israel, restore the kingdom of Christ, and make it what you say it's going to be. I pray you will have encouraged everyone here tonight to live a life that brings glory to God and to deny ourselves so that we can be those who honor God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us on our Fathom Ministries podcast. If this ministry has been beneficial to you in your walk with the Lord, please consider a monthly donation to our ministry effort by clicking on the donate button in the description of this video or podcast. To find out more about Fathom Ministries Church, please join us at fathomministrieschurch.com. Thank you for listening and supporting this ministry.